Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In this video, I want to talk about three interrelated concepts which are of fundamental importance in projective geometry. There's the notion of linear systems, which is a method for constructing morphisms into projective space. There's the notion of line bundles, which we've already seen in this uh, playlist. And then finally, there's the notion of divisors, which are certain uh, co-dimension one sub-varieties and they arise in this study and allow you to um, understand geometrically what's going on in this situation. Okay, so to motivate uh, this uh, theory, uh, probably it will be good to have a look at this question. Okay, um, we're going to look at the question, suppose you have P1 and you have some uh, projective variety X, how do you construct a morphism from X to P1? So X can be any projective variety here, and the one that we'll talk most about will be the projective plane. Okay, so that's going to be the motivating question. Um, in this video, I don't want to give you too many details about the definitions and things like that. I just want to motivate, motivate the key ideas. Okay, so uh, the way we're going to do that, I'll give you the answer for how, how to approach this uh, question. Okay, and the setup interestingly involves the line bundles. And if you've seen my videos on why vector bundles, you would uh, see that uh, one of the reasons why you introduce vector bundles is uh, so that you can generalize the notion of functions to sections okay so this is going to give us more functions okay so remember in projective geometry there's this paucity of functions so uh, introducing things like line bundles allows you to have more so to speak functions okay so we have some line bundle and uh, so here's our uh, projective variety x here and what's a line bundle uh, we'll think of it geometrically so for each point there's a one-dimensional vector space Okay, so when I say one dimensional vector space, of course, that means that it's isomorphic to the ground field, say K, uh, but we don't have some actual uh, isomorphism with K, okay? So it's important to think that for each of the points in here, we don't have an actual number a scalar associated with it. It's just some one dimensional vector space, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to pick two global sections of this line bundle, okay? So the notation for global sections over X of L is just this one here. Okay, so what's a global section? So basically, uh, global means that you're looking at L not on some open set, but on the whole of X, and you just want to look at this, um, this sheaf. Okay, what are the values on the whole of X? Okay, so another way to think about what this is, um, which is related to stuff that we've looked at before, is that we can also look at this uh, set, which will turn out to be actually a vector space, okay, over the ground field K, is that it's the uh, space of homomorphisms from the structure sheet OX to L. And why is that? Well, uh, one of the things is that it's quite easy to see that um, uh, this OX, it's essentially just a sheaf of rings, okay? And there's a sheaf of rings on every open set. There's a distinguished element, the one. Okay, so there's one. So one is a global section here. And to get to, uh, the uh, equality between these two, there's actually a natural canonical isomorphism, so I'll write an equals here, is that you just have a look and see where does the global section 1 in this stru structure sheet land in here, or give you a global section here, okay, and that'll get you uh, uh, um, the isomorphism between the homomorphisms here and the global sections here like that, okay. So let's give a picture of what's going on, so what's a section, another way to think of a section, so to remember how, um, uh, really now this is a line bundle, and we want to look at the associate associated locally free rank one sheaf, okay? So what's a section? The way you should think of it is um, by drawing a graph of it, so to speak. So let's just pick one, say S0, S0 like this, S0, it'll be something like this. For each point here, you pick a uh, value which is on the corresponding one-dimensional vector space, like this one here. So each point, you pick a value like this. So at the end of the day, you may have something like this, okay? And we pick two of them, so we'll pick something else, S1 like that, and it may be something like this that you get. Okay, so that's how we picture two sections. And from that data, I claim that we can try to construct um, a morphism from X to P1. So why is that? Okay, it's very simple. Uh, it's going to be given by this recipe here, and let me explain it pictorially over the other side. So we'll pick a value of X, maybe this one here, there's our X. And you can look at S0 of x, which is this point here. 
this point here there's S0 of x, and that's just some element in this one-dimensional vector space. And you can look at S1 of x, which is this element of this one-dimensional vector space. Now, of course, they don't, these aren't actual numbers, but since they lie in a one-dimensional vector space, you can talk about the ratio between them. And since you can talk about the ratio between them, you can talk about the corresponding point on the projective line. Now, we can do this for each and every single point on x, and essentially, uh, this will define for you a map from x to p1. And since here we'll look at algebraic sections, okay, this will give you an algebraic map from x to p1. Okay, so there are a couple of remarks I want to make about this, which are very important. Uh, um, so firstly, uh, we have here two sections. Uh, it's important to note that, um, yeah, in general, if you have x is a projective variety, there aren't many actual honest-to-goodness functions there. Okay. So you've got two sections here, and one thing that you can do is that you can look at the ratio of two sections. Okay, that's essentially what you have here. But let's look at the ratio as actually S1 divided by S0. Okay, so that makes complete sense. Like, for example, the value here is you um, look at S1 here. This is an element of this uh, one-dimensional vector space. And this will be some scalar multiple of that. Okay, so that scalar multiple will be the value of S1 divided by S0. Okay, and you can do this um, for every point as long as you're not dividing by 0. Okay, so if you're not dividing by zero, that's fine. So that means that even though you might not get a function which is defined everywhere, a regular function defined everywhere, you do get a rational function on x at least. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why this is kind of important to look at sections. Okay, the sections themselves, okay, they're not actually um, honest functions into your ground field. Okay, they, they have values in your line bundle instead. But when you take the ratio of them, they're no longer just sections of some line bundle. They're actual rational functions, x with values in k, except for when you're dividing by 0. The other thing is that, well, I've defined this map here. Actually, it's not everywhere defined. Okay? There's a problem if you have the ratio 0 to 0. Okay? So phi is defined as long as you don't have this condition here, where both s of 0 of x is equal to 0 and s of 1 of x is equal to 0. Okay, so um, firstly, uh, what does that really mean? I think it's quite easy to see pictorially, okay? So these are all one-dimensional vector spaces. And let's say where it intersects with its x, that's going to be the zero of that vector space, okay? So the zero of S0 will be like this point here. And the zero of S1 will be, um, in this case, this point here, okay? So you can talk about zeros of um, sections. You can't talk about their values. Okay, um, in, uh, as being inside K, they live inside the line bundle, but you can talk precisely about when that value is zero. That's okay, because zero is a distinguished element of each and every one of these um, one-dimensional vector spaces. So you can talk about the zeros of the section. And it's basically, as I said, where these black lines intersect this um, uh, purple line, and this purple line is basically uh, what you think of is it's going to be the zero of each and every single one of these one-dimensional vector spaces. Okay, so um, this uh, means that when we're studying these sorts of uh, things and looking at this setup, it's important to look at the zeros of sections, global sections of line bundles. Okay, and if you think about it, because they're a single function, you expect them to carve out a co dimension one sub variety, and that's in some, indeed something that they will do. And this gives you the notion of a divisor essentially. This will be the key thing. Okay. So essentially, divisors, you can kind of think of them as a generalization of the notion of a co-dimension 1 sub-variety, but there's a little bit more information that's involved. Okay. But that already shows you um, how this idea of looking at sub-varieties comes in and is related to what's going on here and why it's important. Okay, so it's pretty abstract, so maybe it's good to look at a little example. So I'm going to put in a rather banal example. You may think it's not very um, interesting, okay, but it turns out in some ways to be the most yeah, interesting one. Okay, so the line bundle uh, that we'll look at is O1 on the projective line. Okay, so we're going to look at the map from the projective line to the projective line. Okay, so what is the projective line? I'll write it as the union of two affine lines in the usual way, affine line with coordinate z and affine line with coordinate z inverse. And we've looked at all the homomorphisms of O into O1. Okay, and they give you the global sections. And we saw it's two-dimensional and they basically correspond to um, linear 
functions or linear polynomials or constant polynomials, okay? So in particular, I can um, pick two of them, which will form a basis, okay? So on A1z, so remember, what is this O1? It's going to be k of z on A1z and k of z inverse. So if I write z inverse is equal to w, it's k of w on the other patch A1z inverse, because the w here is just z inverse. So I can write it as basically uh, the first section, S0 will be 1, inside K of Z. And the second section, um, uh, S1, will be Z, inside K of Z. Now the gluing data is such that since this is O1, you multiply by Z inverse. So if you multiply this by Z inverse, okay, you'll get Z inverse, which is W, inside K of W. That's what this section looks like on this A1Z inverse. And on this other patch here, uh, you multiply by this Z inverse and you'll get S1 equals 1, which is of course inside here and gives you, and that's why you have a global section. Okay, so we've got the data that's involved in this setup. We have a line bundle and we have two global sections. And the question now is, what map does that give us from P1 to P1? It might not be defined everywhere, but actually it turns out it will be. So let me just show you what happens on this patch here. Okay, so we're going to get a map 5 from P1 to P1. Let's just see what happens is A1Z. Okay, so we're going to pick a point Z inside here. And where does it go to? Okay, so the first section is 0. It's just 1. It's a constant function 1. Okay, so that means it just gets into 1. What about the second section? It just gets in Z. Z, 1, colon, Z. Okay, so this is the usual... Um, uh, so what is this? So this is the usual affine patch corresponding to A1Z. And it's just the identity map on that A1Z. So this A1Z will map to A1Z as the identity. And you can check that at infinity if you use the other patch, that it's actually the identity there too. So at the end of the day, this phi is just the identity map. And that's how you recover it, using these two global sections. Okay? So that's rather nice, and that gives us an answer, uh, or gives us a very a good example. You might not think it's very interesting, but actually, this is the example which allows you to look at all, um, all other examples of morphisms into P1. Okay, to understand where we're headed with this, it's uh, probably good to make this following motivational remark, which is basically the affine situation of what goes on here. Okay, so suppose instead of trying to construct morphisms from X to P1, you want to try to construct morphisms of affine varieties from uh, to the affine line. Okay, so you have morphisms psi, say, from an affine variety to A1 of Z. And A1Z, of course, you can think of this as just being uh, K. So the first thing is, what's the analog or the situation here, okay? So if you want to look at the identity on A1Z, well, that's a map from A1 to A1, but you can think of the second A1 as K. So it's a map from A1 to K, and it's a regular function on A1 to K. So it's, in fact, an element of the coordinate ring of A1, which is K of Z. And what polynomial is that? Well, of course, it's just a polynomial given by Z. Z here is the identity on A1Z, okay? And then how do you get um, this map from psi from y to a1? Well, this is also a map from y to k, and you can think of this as a regular function on y, so it's in the coordinate ring of y. And what is that uh, element of the coordinate ring? Of course, it's just going to be psi upper star of z. Okay, You just pull back the function z to here. And the reason why is simple. Remember, how does the pullback work? It's just a composition. So you're going to do the map from y to here, and it's just... Uh, followed by z, which is the identity. And of course, that is just the map psi. So psi is essentially just given by psi upper star of z. So you kind of just pull back the identity. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the projective version of this, replace this a1 with p1. Okay, we have the identity now written in this form, and then we just pull back the same way. So this is the projective on analog. I claim that any morphism from a projective or quasi-projective variety, even x to p1, okay, arises precisely in this form. You have some sort of a line bundle, and then you have these two uh, uh, global sections, and that's used to define this. And so you might ask, so what is that line bundle? And what are those global sections? Well, it turns out that it's more complicated than what you see here, where you just pull back the identity, because the identity in here involves more. So firstly, what you do is what you had before is you had this uh, line bundle, okay, or more precisely, precisely this locally free sheaf of rank 1, this O1, 
that's on here, you need to pull that back to a line bundle here. Okay, that's the first thing. You can pull it back to a line bundle there, and then once you pull that back to a line bundle there, these sections, which aren't uh, functions into your uh, field of scalars, okay, they're functions into your line bundle, you can pull back those sections. So S0 will be the pullback of the one, okay, that you see here, and uh, S1 will be the pullback of this Z, okay? And when you do that, okay, essentially by the same reasons as is described here, you'll find that uh, you will get um, this morphism constructed precisely in this way. Okay, so in that sense, we've answered the question. Okay, if you want to construct a morphism into uh, the projective line, you need to give what? You need to give a line bundle, and you need to give two global sections. Okay, and the global sections have to satisfy this extra um, um, condition here, where the zeros of those two global sections, uh, uh, they shouldn't be any common zeros. Okay, otherwise this is not defined there. Okay, so that's what's going on. Uh, so you may ask, oh, so what's going on with this pullback here? I don't want to say too much about what's going on. Um, so perhaps uh, let me give you the visual explanation of what goes on. Okay, so here's your P1. Okay, that's the black line. Okay, uh, and then what you, oh, no, here's the blue line. That's going to be your P1. And uh, you can think of uh, this line bundle O1 as being a one-dimensional vector space above each and every point. Okay, so where the, uh, this, curved blue line and this one-dimensional uh, vector space intersect will make that the zero of that one-dimensional um, uh, vector space, okay? And so you'll have a section will be like a black line like that's there, okay? So first thing is how do we pull back the line bundle, which is this collection of one-dimensional vector spaces over this P1? So we want to have a collection of one-dimensional vector spaces over each point of this X now and we have a map from here to here. So let's suppose this orange line they're all the points that get mapped to this point here. So the value of the one-dimensional vector space along here is precisely this one-dimensional vector space here. We just copy them over there. Okay, so basically we have copy it. Okay, and we do that for every point. For any point here, okay, what is the one-dimensional vector space here? We just look at the image here and it's that one-dimensional vector space. Okay, what about pulling back a section? So that means that for each and every um, point on this X, I need to give you an element of the corresponding one-dimensional vector space sitting above it. Well, suppose you want to look at this point here, okay? What do you do? Um, you map it down here, and that will give you a value in this one-dimensional vector space here. But since this one-dimensional vector space was defined to be that one, you can pick the corresponding point. So the section there, okay, so this section here, this value here, you can transfer to all these points here like that. And that's how you should visualize what's going on here. If you want something that's a bit more formal, okay, because that really doesn't give you the line bundle structure, the way you do it as follows, okay, is suppose you have this O1, it's given by a line bundle. So essentially you have two open patches, and you have a transition function which tells you how to glue the two trivial uh, bundles together. Okay, on that. So those open patches, that gives you an open cover back here. You just pull back those open sets, it gives you open cover back there. And then to define a, a vector bundle, I just need to give transition functions up here um, using this open cover. Okay, so it's going to turn out to be, when you pull it back, it's going to be trivial on those two um, open sets. And what's the transition function? Well, one thing you can do with a fire remover is you can pull back functions. And that transition function is just an honest to goodness um, invertible function. That's on P1, okay, or rather the, 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 um, the intersection of those open sets. And you just can pull that back to something here, and that will define your fire upper star of O1, or rather the line bundle corresponding to that. Okay, so what's the upshot of this line of thinking? Okay, so suppose we're given some projective variety x, what would algebraic geometers like to do with this x? Of course, they want to determine all the maps of x into projective spaces, in particular P1. And this idea that I mentioned before means that the first thing you want to do is you want to determine all the line bundles on it. Okay, so what they want to do is they want to look at the set of all isomorphism classes of line bundles on x, and that's uh, denoted pick x for the Picard group of x. It turns out this set is actually a group, and so that makes it rather interesting, and it means that it's a bit easier to try to describe this set, because it has more structure. The next thing, to give a map into 
the projective line, you need two global sections. And the next thing one wants to do is for each of these um, line bundles, okay, or rather the corresponding locally free rank one sheaf, okay, what uh, algebraic geometers would like to do is to compute the space of global sections. Okay? And then finally, um, you want to make sure that there is a well-defined map into P1, so you want to look at the zeros. So the next thing is to, given such a global section, determine its zeros. Okay, and this zeros, set of zeros will be a co-dimension one um, sub-variety. As it turns out, we'll need to have a slightly more complicated notion, that of a divisor. Um, so the key point is that when you look in algebraic geometry, the notion of variety that corresponds to radical ideals, okay, sub-varieties, and they correspond to... Um, uh, 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 well, most generally, they correspond to radical uh, ideals, but sometimes right. you want to know uh, the, the uh, f further information, look at more uh, general types of ideals, okay? And that's going to be uh, encapsulated in this notion of a divisor. Okay, so let's have a look and see if you apply this type of uh, thinking, um, what types of results you can get. So I don't want to prove anything here. I just want to show you how this uh, sort of this program kind of works in a, a particular instance. Okay, and I'm going to uh, tell you about how algebraic geometers might want to, for example, show this fact here, okay, using this type of idea. There are no non-constant regular morphisms from the projective plane to P1. Okay, so that's a rather interesting fact. Okay. So how would you approach it using this uh, sort of uh, schema? Okay, the first thing is you want to determine what pick X is. Okay, so uh, pick uh, of, in fact, projective space. Okay, it's very much like the set of line bundles I've shown you for the projective line. There's going to be one for each um, integer, and we'll denote it O of A. That's the standard notation for that as well. And that turns out to be the Picard uh, group of P N. Okay, so it's isomorphic to the group of integers. Okay, and uh, we'll denote them O of A. Okay, the next thing is to work out the space of sections. Okay, so if A is negative, the global sections of O of A is just zero. But if A is uh, non negative, then this space is just a space of degree A homogeneous forms in X0 up to Xn. Let's look at the special, special case of N equals 1. And then we computed the, home, uh, the global sections as homomorphisms from O into A. And basically, they were um, one way to think about them is as polynomials in, say, your variable Z of degree less than or equal to A. Of course, if you have a polynomial in Z, what you can do is you can homo homogenize it. If you just have N equals 1, so you have X0 and X1, you can homogenize that into a homogeneous degree A form in x0 and x1. Okay, so essentially we've proved this fact for n equals 1, and it's true more generally in this form here. Okay, So they're the global section, so what we'll do is basically we need to take two of these homogeneous forms um, of degree a in x0 up to xn okay, to try to get a morphism into p1. Okay, So what are the zeros of this? So I hope you can kind of guess. Okay, So let's just specialize to P2 now. So you've got homogeneous coordinates X0, X1, X2. Okay, And you have two uh, degree A forms inside here, for example. Let's just pick one for starters. A degree A form inside uh, here, X0, X1, X2. Of course, since it's a homogeneous form, you can talk about the zeros, and that gives you a curve. And that curve, that plane curve is precisely the zeros of this section S this global section S. Okay, great. So you have two plane curves inside the projective plane, each of degree A, and Bazou's theorem that any two such curves have to intersect. So they'll have common zeros. Since they have common zeros, you can't define a map into uh, uh, P1. Okay, so that's one way to approach this question, and it gives you a very, very general approach for trying to do this. Okay, so one of the things that you want to study, of course, in geometry is what types of maps do you have. You want to compare them, and that will tell you about the geometry. Okay, and so this is giving you a method, in fact, for showing that such a map doesn't exist. Okay, so of course, it gives you ways of constructing maps if they do exist, and also in this case here, you can show that um, the map doesn't exist. Uh, so before I finish this video, I want to make this rather in interesting remark here. So I've looked at the, some interrelated latent notions here. So this notion of line bundles, okay, and then picking global sections of them gives you, uh, that's essentially what's called a linear system, okay, and that linear system allows you to map into, in this case, a projective line. And more general, this idea can be used to map into projective space even, 
Okay? And one thing that you have to watch out are for the, ze uh, the zeros of these global sections. Now that gives you uh, essentially co-dimensional one sub varieties, which are called um, uh, which are better thought of as actually divisors. So there's a little bit more data involved in what's a divisor. Okay? And uh, it turns out that uh, actually this notion of divisor is even more intimately related to the uh, notions of linear systems and line bundles. Divisors can actually be used to create line bundles okay? and actually create sections of these line bundles as well. So this is a very, very deep relation that I haven't really touched on yet, uh, but we'll uh, do so later in this uh, playlist. Okay, so I hope you, uh, you managed to get a little bit of a preview for these three very important notions in uh, algebraic geometry, and particular projective geometry, this notion of linear systems as a way to map into uh, the projective line, and later, uh, more generally, into projective space. They use line bundles, and there's a key notion of divisors which comes into this. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics. <laughs>